See these hairs on Sully's arm from Monsters, Inc.? Instead of animating each hair one by one, Pixar computer scientists created a program called Fizz-T, which would automate the movement of Sully's hairs based on what's happening in any given scene. Pixar would later use the same system to simulate realistic fur on animal characters, like Remy the Rat and Doug the Dog. Every single Pixar movie brought at least one groundbreaking innovation, each changing the future of animation and movie making as a whole. Let's look at how every Pixar movie brought animation into the future. Computer graphics were around in the 80s in small doses, but to make fully animated movies like Toy Story, the industry needed software that could render complex animations. Rendering is when a computer takes all the info about an animation, the different algorithms for color, motion, pattern, light, shadow, and effects, and basically films the movie. In the late 80s, some of Pixar's top researchers got together to design RenderMan, a program that combines all the 3D assets created for each frame of a movie and translates them into a film-quality, photorealistic final image. Toy Story wasn't the first movie to use RenderMan, but it was the first ever 3D animated feature film. And the only way Pixar could render the whole movie was with RenderMan, which shows how this software revolutionized animation. Since then, Render Man has been the final step in the production pipeline behind every single Pixar film, and many non-Pixar films too. In fact, it became the industry standard for rendering, and the first software product to be awarded an Oscar. In 1998, A Bug's Life presented a different challenge, creating characters with a smooth texture and fluid lifelike movements. For years, 3D models, both in CG animated movies and video games, had been mapped with polygons. That made some characters come out looking patchy, like Andy in Toy Story, whose hand isn't smooth like a human hand should be. So in A Bug's Life, Pixar's artists applied a modeling technique they used on their Oscar-winning short, Jerry's Game. This was called the subdivision technique, which one of Pixar's founders helped invent. It's when a modeling artist subdivides a hard-edged shape enough times that it appears as a smooth surface. A Bug's Life was the first feature film to use subdivision, which worked especially well on hard-bodied insects like ants to create glossy textures. And the team was able to experiment with one soft creature, a Bavarian caterpillar named Heimlich. See all his smooth curves and rolls? That's thanks to subdivision, which made it possible to create this type of plump, squishy bug. This technology would eventually be used for almost every object in Pixar films. And like RenderMan, subdivision became a standard technique in the industry, later helping to create CG characters in live-action movies, like Gollum in the second and third Lord of the Rings. If you look back at Andy in the original Toy Story, you'll notice his flesh looks a little too similar to the plastic surfaces on his toys. It lacks detail. For Toy Story 2, Pixar wanted to give Andy, his mom, and the new humans in the story more natural skin. So the studio created a major addition to RenderMan, a shader. This added toolset helped Pixar's shading artists paint layers of detail over the basic renderings of characters. Like real-life makeup artists, they could now give humans unique skin characteristics like pores, veins, sweat, redness, whiteheads, moles, whiskers, or a five o'clock shadow making them look less plastic and more alive. Pixar had to create some very furry monsters for Monsters, Inc., including the eight-foot-tall Sullivan, who had nearly three million hairs on his body. Animating every strand of hair one by one would have been impossible, especially since Sully appears in over 600 shots. So Pixar set up a department dedicated to simulation, a way to automate the movement of elements like hair, fur, and clothing. The team also built a simulator engine called Fizz-T, which calculates, for example, how hair moves with the character's movements, or how hairs collectively respond to forces like gravity, wind, or snow. Pixar has used Fizz-T on every one of its movies since then to give realistic movement to everything from human flesh to the suckers on an octopus. Pixar moved underwater for Finding Nemo. So the studio had to nail the appearance of light passing through objects in the ocean, like the several thousand jellyfish in this sequence. These jellies called for different shading than any other creature Pixar had worked on. As CG supervisor Lisa Forsell said, 
The team didn't want the jellyfish to look transparent like a window or translucent like a shower curtain. Their membrane needed to resemble bathroom glass, where you can see through it, but it's all distorted and blurry. So Pixar wrote a whole new shading system called Transblurrency, which blurred the background of objects based on their depth and distance from the viewer, calculating camera position and optical light paths into the equation. You can see how the background is most blurred in the middle of the jellyfish and least blurred on the edges of its bell. That's true to the way light refracts through a jellyfish's membrane, and it captures that bathroom window effect they were going for. The Incredibles was Pixar's first movie with an entirely human cast of characters. And when it came to building those characters, none of them were harder, literally, than this one. Bob, better known as Mr. Incredible, would be the most muscular character Pixar had ever created. So the studio came up with a completely new approach to his layers of skeleton, muscle, and fat. The team designed a type of muscle rig called Goo that let a character's skin respond to their moving muscles. Better yet, animators could see this response in real time as they moved their character around. This led to breakthroughs in body parts that had always been problematic in animation, like the shoulders. Until this point, Pixar had stuck with characters that have more primitive shoulders. Look at Buzz, whose shoulder consists of a ball and socket, or Woody, who just has a stitch where his arm hinges off his body. Using Goo, animators could master the tiny details of Mr. Incredible's much more complex shoulder movement, like how his trapezius muscle affects his pectoral muscle. Once the rigging and modeling team perfected Bob, they could use his skeleton as a template, reshaping the muscle rig to fit other characters and giving them equally complex motion. In real life, a car would look weird if it didn't have any reflections on its surface. But translating this on screen can get complicated, especially for a movie like Cars. See, shiny cars reflect other shiny cars, which makes for a lot of reflections at play in scenes like this one. The only way Pixar could master all these reflective metal surfaces was with ray tracing, a technique of mapping out all the rays of light in a scene as they bounce off walls, objects, and characters. Pixar first used ray tracing in two shots of a bug's life to create the reflections on a glass bottle, but it only became a main part of the rendering process with cars, where it was used to create the sharp shadows and detailed reflections the filmmakers needed. Ray tracing transformed animation. It even ended up on CGI elements in live action movies, like this Transformer or Iron Man's suit. And it set the stage for even more complex lighting in future Pixar movies, like Monsters University. In Ratatouille, all the dishes had to look absolutely delicious. So the shading, art, and lighting team studied food photography to figure out what exactly makes food look good on camera. They determined that a lot of a dish's visual appeal boils down to the appearance of softness, which comes from light passing through the food. See, a lot of foods are actually kind of translucent, which means some light will go through the surface of the material, scatter around, and then reflect back. Pixar already had a way of replicating this effect, a technique for rendering translucent materials called subsurface scattering. This tool modeled light scattering outwards through the surface of the food. But the filmmakers were still going for a more translucent look and wanted to show light going straight through the food as well. So they developed a new type of light called gummy, based partly on the gummy bear-like quality of Marlin and Nemo in Finding Nemo. Take this shot of cheese, grapes, and bread. The cheese in this first shot has no lighting. With the subsurface scattering, you can see the outer edges and top layers illuminated. And finally, with gummy, the light permeates every layer of the cheese to give it a soft, diffused glow. They used this approach on entire shelves of cheese and vegetables, as well as on liquids like wine. Together, subsurface scattering and gummy created a two-part translucency effect that made sure no food item would look waxy, hard, or plastic on screen. On the old Pixar camera, any tilt or pan was a two-dimensional move without any change in perspective. But Wally's filmmakers wanted the viewer's perspective to shift when the virtual camera did, so it feel like the camera was actually moving in space. So they rebuilt their camera system, modeling it on the way an anamorphic camera would move and consulting with a live action cinematographer, a first for any Pixar film. The first act of the movie went for a loose handheld feel designed to look like it was shot from a camera operator's shoulder. 
The second and third acts are supposed to look like they're shot with a steady cam. And since a camera never moves perfectly in real life, director Andrew Stanton said his team spent probably 90% of their time putting little imperfections into the virtual camera. There are shots where the focus lags, tracking shots with a little bump in the camera movement, and scenes where it feels like the camera person sees something and catches it a few frames later. The result is perfectly imperfect. In Up, Carl's canopy of balloons is central to the storyline. It involved thousands of colorful balloons, each attached to the chimney of Carl's house by a string, with thousands of collisions going on at any given moment. And when one balloon bumped into another, the second one would bump into a third balloon, and so on. At the time, Pixar's physical simulator could only handle about 500 balloons, so the effects department wrote a new program to run under the simulator. Using Newton's laws of motion, the computer accounted for forces acting on the balloons in every shot, and then decided how each balloon should move. It also made sure that all the balloons were buoyant, that their strings were attached, and that the wind was blowing through them in a realistic way for every single frame of animation. Ultimately, Pixar's simulator was powerful enough to handle 10,297 balloons. Toy Story 3 brought together a bigger cast of characters, three times as many as in the original movie. Costuming all of them wouldn't be easy, especially when introducing characters like Bonnie, who wears three different outfits in the movie, or Ken, who changes costumes in every scene. To dress them all, Pixar needed a faster way of making clothes. Traditionally, the studio used a 2D garment tailoring system that required artists with special tailoring skills to cut out pieces of cloth and stitch them together in the computer. Toy Story 3 used a new 3D cloth system that let any modeling artists, not just expert digital tailors, sculpt garments like a tailor would in the real world, and then turn those garments into simulatable clothes. Since more modelers could build garments, Pixar's artists could dress over 300 animated characters for Toy Story 3, compared to the 76 in the first movie. The filmmakers behind Cars 2 envisioned it as a Jason Bourne-style spy movie, where the cars would race around cities from London to Tokyo. They wanted to reproduce those settings with a level of detail that was 10 times what Pixar had put into any other film. For one of the movie's biggest sequences, that meant making specific improvements to the way Pixar depicted waves. Technology from Finding Nemo was best suited for calmer waters, but in Cars 2, the filmmakers wanted to show rough, high waves slamming into the sides of the boat. They came up with an ocean generator called Tessendorf, which used algorithms to simulate sharper, cuspier waves that captured the danger of an ocean's choppy surface. With this, Pixar could better convey the physics of the natural world and pushed its water simulation to the next level. Detailed, realistic simulation became the company's calling card, continuing with the curly hair in Brave. We'll get to that in part two.